Hello everyone, I'm Ian Waterhouse and welcome to Barking Mad, the official podcast of the British Automobile Racing Club that aims to bring you the latest news, reports, opinions and interviews from the world of motorsport. Now, whether you're a regular listener or if this is the first time you're joining us, one thing is always guaranteed when it comes to Barking Mad and that's that it's packed full of full throttle racing chat from start to finish. Now, before we offer up a sneak peek Well, what's to come in this episode? It's about time I introduce my Barking Mad co-host. I always get excited for this bit as well. And it's the man that has covered just about every mile of motorway this past month, Alan Hyde. Alan, how are you? (laughs) <laughs> well, I, feel, I, I have covered a few miles, Ian. Uh, and nice to see you again. Um, uh, mainly miles, yeah. uh, and we talked about it on the last episode of Barking Mad podcast, um, up to Knock Hill in Oof. Scotland for the BTCC and back down again. Bit of a fraud. So after having done all those miles, um, I had a, I had a, can you believe, do you, do you know what this is? I had a weekend off last weekend. I have no idea what a weekend off is. Uh, now, if anybody's listening, uh, you won't be able to see Alan's face, but it looks like you enjoyed a bit of sunshine, Alan. <laughs> well, oh, well that's, yes, thank you. thank you for pointing it out. Do not adri- adjust your sets. Um, yeah, no, I got a bit burnt on Sunday. Um, so it, it being a weekend off, I thought I'd make the most of it. Nice day on, on Sunday. Go down to the, to the coast. Uh, go down to the beach. Why not? So uh, down to uh, Calshot Beach on the, on the south coast. I only spent really a couple couple of hours or three hours down there. But on the drive on the way out, I thought, I feel a bit sore. And it, it's it's a weird thing. I I took no precautions whatsoever um, because I walk up and down the pit lane, as do you, and I rarely yeah. sort of get, get burnt. It, it's, a, it's a very rare thing. And I, I'm, I'm old and I've got hardy skin by now, so I've been taken a bit by surprise. But, yeah, I'm a bit red. On, <laughs> so there's no covering it up. Well, if you're watching on YouTube, please comment below. Uh, what, what do we make of Alan's? Uh, yeah. Let's call it suntan, Alan. Let's, let's call Looks it that. Like a do tomato. you remember? Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's just recap a little bit, Alan. Do you remember in episode five, uh, we asked a question for everybody to comment below their favourite circuit? We're trying to find the the world's most popular circuit. Well, we're going to continue doing that. Uh, so do comment below which is your favourite circuit. It doesn't have to be UK based either. It could be absolutely anywhere in the world. Now I've compiled a list of where we've got so far and it is a very global list. So listen to this and if you're watching this or listening to this uh, and the circuit that you think is the best in the world does, isn't mentioned, then please, please, please do drop us a comment over at the Bark YouTube channel if you're not watching it there. So this is the list we've got. Do we get anyone agreeing with us? Because we both went for Thruxton. Uh, well, you're about to find out. Does Thruxton make the list? We're about to find mm. out. Somebody agrees with everything you said. I think you have a secret admirer as well, by the way, Alan. I won't say who it is, but somebody commented anything Alan says. So uh, <laughs> I think you've got a bit of an admirer <laughs> oh, there. I like that. Right, this That's is very good. <laughs> <laughs> this is the list so far. So we've got Monaco, Nurburgring, Montreal, Santa Pod, Spa, Pembrey. Melbourne Park, Laguna Seca, Silverstone, but somebody's very specific about it being the old layout, but Silverstone, Silverstone. Uh, Monza, Circuit of the Americas, Thruxton, Suzuka, and Interlagos. So yes, Thruxton does make our list. Now, if you've just listened to that, and you think there's a better circuit in the world, comment over at the Bark YouTube channel uh, on the podcast episode. And tell us why as well. Uh, but what do you make of that list, Alan? I, 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 yeah, it's difficult to disagree with many of them. Uh, the fact that Le, Le Mans is on the list, uh, the fact that um, Nürburgring is on the list, these are um, legendary circuits, uh, slightly different to the ones that we came up with. Um, we, we came up with them uh, really because, um, for personal reasons, really, just the memories that they, they hold for us. But um, for fantastic circuit, I'm glad that somebody mentioned the Nürburgring, glad someone mentioned Le Mans as well. Would it be the old Le Mans without the uh, chicanes down the Mulsanne Strait? I'd go for that. Okay, well, look, there, there we go. We'll be very specific with Le Mans then. So uh, comment below. I went to Le Mans uh, at the final year that there was the Mulsanne Strait without the two chicanes in it. So it was the following year that it came in. Oh, and wow. the reason that I went there was it was the first job that I ever had in motorsport. Um, it was 1989. And I was commissioned to write the music for the video because I was a musician at the time, um, a, a producer of music. And I was commissioned to write the music for the video of Le Mans for that year. 
and and the guy the the producer said have you ever been to Le Mans and I said no he said you need to go you need to get the feel of the night so that you write the the right kind of soundtrack for the night 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 thing so uh, so yeah that's incredible I'm learning a lot about you Alan and, and I'm liking what uh, I'm learning <laughs> I'm a dark horse <laughs> I've been around a long time <laughs> Uh, well, 1989, uh, I was four. So uh, I let uh, everybody else know really? as to how old I am now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show, we can give you a little snippet of what's to come in this episode six of the Barking Mad podcast. It's got all the ingredients of being an absolute belter, hasn't it, Alan? really does. As always, we'll be catching up with BARC event manager David Whedon to discuss the latest talking points from inside the club. And then, and I'm really looking forward to this very much, oh, uh, yes. we'll be joined by two-time British touring car champion John Cleland. And John is someone never short of a story or two. So, so buckle in and get ready for this one. Absolutely, yeah. Strap yourselves in. Certainly, yeah. Lots to look forward to, that's for sure. Uh, but before we get up to all that, uh, it's time to tell you about our brilliant partners, BP Fleet Solutions UK. Now, if you're a member of the BARC, you can invest less on fuel and more on winning courtesy of the BP Plus Fuel and Charge Card. It gives members and podcast listeners exclusive discounts on fuel. The BP Plus Fuel and Charge Card can be used at 3,400 locations offering 6p per litre off both standard and ultimate grade fuels at 1,200 UK fuel stations. Wow, 1,200 UK fuel stations. Uh, there are also significant savings to be made on electric charging too. The BP Plus fuel and charge card can be used by anyone and the collaboration with the BARC marks a significant milestone in providing benefits to racing drivers, teams and their associated businesses. Yeah, if you're a Bark member and you want to save money on your fuel, head to www.bp.com forward slash Bark. If you need any help or more information, hit the callback button on the website and a member of the BP Fleet Solution UK team will contact you. Now, for those of you that are not yet a member of the BARC but still want to receive great rates on fuel and electric charging, all you have to do is head over to applynow.bpplus.co.uk. Fantastic stuff. Right, I'm ready. Alan's clearly ready, and hopefully you are as well. It's time to kick off episode six of the Barking Mad podcast. As always, our first guest on the podcast is the man that lives and breathes the BARC. It is, of course, the event manager, David Weed. And David, how are you? I'm all right, thank you. How are you? Oh, not too bad, thanks. It's uh, good to see your face again, and uh, quite a bit's been going on over the last couple of weeks, David. It's uh, uh, it's been an eventful time, safe to say, with the BARC. It has. We've been really, really busy. Had quite a lot of events on, so been dotting about the country, um, organising those. But yeah, really, really busy lately. Where exactly have you been dotting yourself, David? Um, two weekends back, I was at Donington Trucks. This weekend, just gone, I was at Snetterton for the Caterham meeting. As um, you can see from Ian's selfies that have been plastered all over the internet this morning. Um, <laughs> Saw <all> those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, well, let's touch on that, actually, because that was at Donington Park, and, it, and of course it was a big, in every sense of the word, weekend at Donington Park. It was convoy in the park, and it certainly put a show on, didn't it, David? It was mega busy. Um, we obviously had the, the British trucks and then the international trucks as well, which is good to see some... All the drivers that we haven't seen out for a while, um, especially European drivers. We had um, John McGuinness, bike legend, out in one of the trucks. He did reasonably well. Um, hopefully try and get him out for a, a few more rounds maybe next year. Um, but, uh, yeah, really, really, really busy weekend. Um, lots and lots of racing. Lots of crowd. The crowd were huge. It was. Um, there was 1,500 show trucks in the middle as well at Donington. I've never seen that many there wow. before. It was absolutely rammed. I have watched a few YouTube videos. Um, I, I didn't actually realise how big truck racing was to the trucking world, um, but I watched a couple of videos last night of just, just general show truck people who'd, who'd filmed their weekend and put it on YouTube, and one of the videos had like 150,000 views in three days, and it, wow. it's just, um, oh, yeah. it's a real eye-opener to understand that uh, the truck racing, the following it has is really, really big, um, you know, really big, um, so, uh, really, really impressive event. Good, great weekend. 
Yeah. And we had loads of other stuff on there, off, off track action. I mean, we had the caravan smash and the rally cross cars yeah. and the stock cars and the fairgrounds. And um, so, f from a, a point of view of a family having a weekend away, um, fantastic. Did you get to talk to the legend that is uh, John McGuinness? Yeah, did you get to talk to him? And I, I was going to say, was he in was he in fine form? Because he can be a he can be a loaded gun of entertainment. Well, Alan, we just we just set up actually uh, to interview John uh, in one of the hospitality areas, and then some live music started up literally opposite. So, John very kindly invited us into his uh, his own truck, his hospitality area, his own uh, uh, caravan, shall Did we say? Well. And it was bigger than my house. And uh, yeah, he was lovely. We, we managed to sit down with him for about 20 minutes. So I said, we were with Pointy from the British Truck Racing Championship. And I said, all right, we, we've got about 10 yeah. minutes for this. Uh, half an hour later, we were drinking Diet Cokes uh, in, his, <laughs> in, in his caravan. And it was absolutely fantastic. David, did you get a chance to, yeah, to catch up with guy. John at all? A little bit. What, what impresses me about John is, he, I mean, apart from Joey Dunlop, he's the, one of the most successful if not the most successful TT racer of, of recent years, if not all time. But he's so humble and down to earth. Because you go yeah. up to him and mm. go, you've got to be mad riding that thing around. He goes, it's just my hobby. I'm a bricklayer. I, I, I'm mm. a, a normal person who works Monday to Friday like everybody else. I just, I'm good at my hobby. Um, he's really humble. Top blog. And hopefully, like I said, we'll, we'll get him out again next year. Um, I think that'd be really, really good. I recently saw an interview with him, David, and he was um, he was um, he was being serious. Actually, he said, and, and the most common thing that he gets um, spoken to about people say, "You must be mad to be doing that on the on the Isle of Man," and he said, "But actually, to have uh, driven the amount of miles that I have, and to have hit every apex on every corner, um, I think we're actually." I think we can call ourselves athletes. And it was a, a moment of uh, crystal realisation that, no, they're not mad. They're actually the most skilled sportsmen that probably we watch. I mean, John's not what... When you say the word athlete, you think Limford Christie or, you know, um, Carl Lewis or, or, or someone like that. Not John McGuinness. To look at him, he's not what you would define as an athlete. But... To hang on to one of those bikes around the TT course, flipping your way mm. from one side to the other at 180, 190 miles an hour, you've got to be an athlete. You're pretty cool. You've got yeah. to have some yeah, stamina. Yeah. Pretty, pretty much. He does on. touch on that as well, Alan, when we had the chance to sit down with him in his trailer and, and he was talking about it and he said he's not mad because if he was mad, he would have no. crashed. <laughs> do you know what I mean? He, say, he yes. says it, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to do what he's done. He, exactly. Yeah. He says it's, it's calculated is what it is. And um, it, he takes risks, but he doesn't go overboard, which actually, when you think about it, makes complete sense because you can't be mad to do the Isle of Man does, TT yeah. that amount of times, have that much success because no. madness will, will get you into trouble. And to hit your apex... Uh, lap after lap, mile after mile on every corner is, uh, yeah, it's just um, uh, not mad, phenomenal, I think is the, the way we can say yeah. it. Um, can, can we move on, David, to the fact that um, uh, we have had our first BARC champion uh, crowned uh, just uh, just a couple of weeks ago? Um, Connor Mills, who has won the inaugural Legends Cars Elite Cup with JLM, and uh, that was after three meetings supporting the BTCC. So, Big, big year for the Legends Championship. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to be supporting um, Toka from a commercial point of view has been fantastic for the Legends. I mean, it's really got them out to a to a, a national audience. Um, they've always run roughly with the alongside the Truck Championship or the, the Pickup Championship, but to, to move them onto the Premier Package three times this year um, has been fantastic. The grids have always been great. The close, close racing. Um, and I think they're back with us for one more. Um, I think they're trucks at Brands Hatch at the end of the year. Um, they will be, be racing there, but obviously not part of the, 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 the little championship they had for Toka. But they've, they're basically running two championships this year, one sort of on the Toka package and one off the Toka package. So um, I believe we'll have a, another Legends champion to, to crown near the end of the year. 
And the and the great thing about it, David, is is that um, they provided for us certainly at the final meeting of the year exactly what Legends cars do. It was incredibly close racing around Knock Hill in every single type of weather that could be thrown at us over the course of six races, and we didn't know who had won until we got the abacus out after the final race. And I, I don't think anybody else knew. Even the drivers didn't know. It was so so close. Credit to to the championship, really. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the, the best thing is that even though there is some different models, as such as a Ford Coupe and a Chevy Coupe, and we've got the sedan and the Savan, and the Savan, um, the, the performances um, between all the different models and, and, and et cetera is, is so close that it doesn't matter which one you're in with regards to model, it, it, you are competitive or you have a competitive car under you. They're all so close. Um, and I just think that that lends to to close racing, obviously, um, and the 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 layout of Knock Hill, um, the, the the geography of Knock Hill, um, always lends to some fantastic racing. Yeah, it certainly does. So we've been to Donington Park, we've been to Knock Hill. Uh, that's not it though, because the classic touring cars had their festival at Croft. They they did. They had their their journey up north. Um, they got really good grids. We had the Super Tourers out, and um, I've had a chat with Stuart Kay, obviously chairman of CTCRC and races there. And, um, he sent me some photos. There was a really good crowd. They did a pit walk. They had the Super Tourers out in the pit lane, um, and I think a, g- a good weekend enjoyed um, by all the competitors and all the all the spectators. I think they actually got a lot more spectators than they were expecting to get, and I think they were they were really pleased about that. Um, I heard. Um, they had to. <laughs> I heard the CTCRC boys drank the bar dry on on Saturday night and actually had to <laughs> send someone out on a on a beer run to the supermarket to to restock. Um, so they they um, definitely got in the um, in the. Uh, what am I trying to say? The oh, like spirit Croft. of things. Yeah, I like Croft. It, it's nice. From, from a point of view of a driver, it's, it's a Croft's place. got everything. It's got fast corners, slow corners. It's got bank corners. It's got hairpins. It's got twiddly bits it's got everything you can think of actually it's a very technical circuit um unfortunately underutilized maybe a little bit but but um you know from from a technical point of view it's up there with a with an angle c oh, or a, something like circuit. that you know well it so. hasn't made the list yet of our uh, we're trying to find the most popular circuits around the world oh. and nobody's mentioned croft yet so if croft is your favorite circuit if you're watching or listening this uh, do Good pop point. it in the comment section on the bark uh, youtube channel because uh, yeah, we, we, we're trying to build out the list, aren't we? I mean, as many circuits as possible. And, and another circuit that hasn't been mentioned yet, uh, and you were there, I believe, at the weekend, David, is Snetterton. You were there for the caterings. Yeah, hun- hundreds of caterings. Hundreds <laughs> and hundreds of caterings. Um, and we had all the catering championships there from the, the factory. We had Mini Challenge Club Sport there, which is the, 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 the lowest ladder of the Mini Challenge um, championships. Um, we also had um, the Supercats. With us, um, which they are, are crazy fantastic. They've, well, they've got they? a, yeah, totally. No seatbelts, no, no, no seatbelts. Yeah. No, yeah. seat, no seat it's, it's mad. Levers, you are designed to come out and slide down the track. Um, and then we also had the <laughs> Uncle Luke <laughs> Snetterton Saloons. Crazy grin on his face. <laughs> yeah, um, I do love the supercars, they've got a, a dear place in my heart. Um, and we also had Uncle Luke's Snetterton Saloons, which was a 45 minute race. Um, you could have two drivers if you wanted to. Um, there was some fantastic machinery out in that, some some ex British GT Lotus and um, some M3s and, and stuff like that. So that was a real um, close 45 minute race. But yeah, a really good weekend. Um, not a lot of accidents, not a lot of red flags or safety cars, just good racing. We had a really tight timetable on Sunday and we actually got finished just before time. Um, so, you know. Pats on the back to all the drivers for for getting around safely and, and not and causing the us too many hassles David, and loss of time. And the organisers, David. Pat on the back to the organisers and of, the marshals of, and everybody. Of course, absolutely. yeah. I, I've got to be honest with you. It's it's one of those weekends where um, you've got Kirsty and, and Lily from Caterham and and Rob and Tom from Mini Challenge and Ian from Supercarts and um, Julian from from Snets and Saloons are coordinators. Are that was strong. That actually, I I didn't have a lot to do this weekend because. Um, you know, you, you've got really good professionals there who um, look after their their competitors really well. So, and um, from my point of view, um, 
really easy weekend actually enjoyable weekend so yeah good all we'll good. have to find some more work for you to do then David Shh. <laughs> <laughs> while, while we're on the subject of, of marshals and uh, officials at race meetings uh, uh, David if if somebody is thinking about becoming a marshal how can they do it with the BARC um, as you can see we've got a some information on the wall behind us with the the, the Bark Marshall team. Um, so the best way to do it is you can actually um, have a little look on the Bark website. There is a specific marshalling page on bark.net. There's a, a list of all the different types of roles we have. Um, obviously there is a lot of different type of roles. If you want to keep dry you can come and have a role in race control. There's race phones, race radios, clerk at the course, incident officers etc. Um, if you fancy standing out in the rain you can be a, a track marshal or an incident officer or um, you know, a pit lane marshal or a paddock marshal, there's so many different roles. Um, some roles mean that you're travelling around the venue, some roles mean that you stay in one place, um, etc, etc. But yeah, there's a, a contact page on our website where you'll be able to contact either Josh or Julie who look after the, the officials and marshals. And We can sign you up to a, a taster day. We do taster days at most of our events where you can come and have a, a day with the, the chief marshal and they will take you around and show you all of the different roles, um, how the, the roles are performed, who performs them. Um, and, and give you a little bit of an idea of you know roughly where you'd want to to volunteer at. Um, f for me personally, I have to say thank you to everyone who volunteers for us. Um, this is my full time job. This is how I put bread on the table. And if I didn't have these volunteers, I'd struggle to run events at weekends. Um, so, so for me, the the, the marshalling community and the officials community is um, very very important to me. Yeah, very well said. Very well said. Become a marshal and keep a roof over David's head. That's the that's a great new slogan yeah. for recruiting marshals to <laughs> motorsport. Um, uh, David, let's have a look what's coming up next for uh, BARC. Have we got a busy time coming up? Uh, yeah, we've got this weekend alone. We've got the um, the world famous Citroen Two CV Twenty Four Hour Race. Yeah, um, we've got Junior Saloons and Track Attack in support. Um, and they'll all be finished by about 2, 2.30 in the afternoon Saturday. And then the 24-hour race starts at um, 3 o'clock in the afternoon and obviously runs through to, to 3 o'clock the next afternoon. So it's um, it's well supported. We have a lot of um, European, French, Belgian entries this year. They've started mm -hmm. to come back after COVID. We did have a couple of lean years mm -hmm. where we were struggling to get entries mm -hmm. from the continent. But um, this will be, you know, we had, like I said, good entries for the trucks from the continent. We've got good entries for the two CVs from the continent. So hopefully that is a sign that we've we've you know sort of got past the the issues with having breakfast uh, breakfast Brexit <laughs> and carnets etc. Um, <laughs> and we we are starting to see a lot more sort of competitors coming back over from the continent, which is great to see. Good news that that is a great meeting. It's a great meeting. A, a wonderful race that. Yeah, I've done it myself. In fact, I did it um, the year just after we came back from COVID, and, and it's nice to see that people are coming back over from uh, from the continent now because I think that was one of the, those lean years that I did. It was still a good field, though, I have to say, and, and spirits mm. were still mm. very high. Uh, David, is, is, have we got anything else coming up in the next couple of weeks before we, we have uh, the next episode? Um, we've got some rallycross on, club and rallycross on at Pembrey. Um, which I'm going down to look after. Um, that's BTRDA. It's obviously not a bar championship, but they run with us twice at Pembrey, and we supply their marshals and officials. Yeah. Um, it's a good relationship we have with BTRDA. It's a really good clubman's rally cross. Um, and then we've got Goodwood Revival coming up as well. Um, we've got Snetterton Trucks, which is supported by Brick Car um, and Classic Touring Cars. So we've got, we've got a lot of big events coming up. Um, over the next two or three months and the, the run into the end of the year in November. Yeah, do uh, visit the BARC website and you can see a list of all of the events that we've still got remaining for uh, 2023. Still an awful lot to come. And if you want to watch any of the action, the Bark YouTube channel is the place to go. And if you want to watch any of the action that's already taken place this year, all of the content that we've been filming, uh, be it live or just video, does stay there, as well as these episodes of the podcast as well. You can go back and watch them uh, on the Bark YouTube channel. Now, David, before we let you go, we're going to do something a little bit different uh, this time one final question for you and uh, what we want you to do is we want you to pick your dream team basically so you can pick any championship to enter in the world and we want you to select a team manager and two drivers now these can be anybody from club racing from uh, formula one whatever you, it's your choice so what championship would you like to enter first of all formula one formula one okay who's your team manager 
went Frank Williams. Frank Williams and two drivers. Jim Clark and Michael Schumacher. Now, it could be anybody. Absolutely anybody. You, you could choose yourself Jim if you Clark want, and Mike, David. Jim, Jim Clark and Michael Schumacher. <laughs> every time. Played a percentage game. Why those two drivers? Because Jim Clark's, in my eyes, the greatest. You're not fancy ever lived, driving most no. natural. You're, not, you're not fancy driving it. No, I wouldn't do it justice. If, if This is one thing I always say is, if I could pick it, I'd never drive myself. I'd always put some good drivers in. Um, but Jim Clark, <laughs> pers- pers- every time. Um, and Michael Schumacher every time um, like I said p- percentage wise you don't get better than, than Clark and Schumacher that's my personal opinion obviously but yeah, yeah Jim Clark he, he is oh, can't go wrong Jim there, Clark's my all time he was very quick with his answer he, he was wasn't he I've thought yeah. about this one many many times yeah. but yeah Jim, Jim Clark every time absolutely without shadow of a doubt Jim Clark every time have you been to the Jim Clark Museum up in Scotland? Uh, do you know you? what? I, I haven't. I haven't been up there since they've they've um, rebuilt it all. Because originally it was just a room in a house, um, and they've obviously had a, a good yes, grant have, yeah. from lottery yeah, or, have, yeah. or government or something, and they've they've really um, turned it into a, a fantastic yeah. visitor centre. I know Dario bought Jim's um, Lotus Cortina that he raced in the the British Saloon Car Championship, or was it as it was before BTCC. Um, and, and he's got that on permanent display there. Um, if you go on YouTube, there's actually a video of Dario driving it yes. to the museum for the opening day. And he drives it on all the roads that Jim Clark learned right, to drive yeah. on as a kid. Yeah. I mean, cool just, that? yeah, Jim, Jim Clark every time. <laughs> you, you, I don't think there's ever yeah. been such a, a natural racing driver. Just from birth, just every piece of talent he needed was there. But yeah, Jim Clark, absolute god. Good. Who would you have, Alan? As your two drivers? Uh, what a good question. Can you get back to me on that? I'll tell you what. Why don't we ask everybody else? Yeah, you can think about that, uh, and for and we'll ask that again in episode seven. All right. Uh, and anybody watching this now, by the way, let let us know who you would have your two drivers, your team manager, and, and what would be the the championship that you'd like to enter. Can be Formula One, can be anything. Uh, we would like to know. Uh, David, thank you so much. Um, I'd say you're a busy man, but uh, it sounded like you had a quite an easy weekend at Snetterton. So uh, we'll, we'll chat to the, the BARC hierarchy and find some more work for you to do. No worries. <laughs> Spend all my time giving you selfies. Cheers, That's David. Thanks. Thank you again. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> We're too busy taking <laughs> selfies. <laughs> uh, David Weeder, thank you so much for Good joining us. Always a pleasure. Thank you, chaps. Cheers. Now, our next guest really does need no introduction, but we're going to give him one anyway. He is a two-time British Touring Car uh, Champion, a car salesman. I'm not sure he's going to like that description. Uh, And one of the nicest and funniest people you could hope to wish to meet in a race paddock. It is, of course, John Cleland. John, nice to see you. You do scrub up nicely, don't you, in the office? (laughs) Yeah, well, my day job, unfortunately... Um, is still pretty important to me, but uh, one of these days I might have to stay at home and cut the grass and things like that. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that's really a John Cleland kind of thing to do, is it? Nah, I, I, I think that's a problem. I'm, I've, I love this business. I've been in the car industry for oh, literally since I was born, but actively, really actively, sort of fifty odd years. And I love it. I mean, even through the whole of COVID, it was great fun. It was back to the good old days and things that, you know, it wasn't the same pressure. Um, I love it. Absolutely. But one of these days I'm going to have to say, nah, enough's enough. I need to go and do something else. Yeah, I'm not sure that's ever going to happen. We we bumped into you. Uh, the whole reason that this interview has come about, um, uh, John, is uh, the fact that you were at Knock Hill for touring cars a couple of weeks ago, not only on the on the Saturday, but the Sunday as well. Um, and uh, we were all reminded as people listened to your sage words of wisdom overlooking <coughs> the three races at, uh, at Knock Hill. Um, everybody realised, actually, we really miss hearing from him. So it'd be quite nice to hear a little bit more from him because you were brilliant. Uh, you gave us the heads up about the final race. It's definitely not going to rain. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm probably the last guy you need to take information from regarding Knock Hill, either the weather, the track, how to win there, 
how to go around the place. It was my bogey track. And um, when we first went there in 92, all my uh, fellow BTCC competitors said, well, that's fantastic. You'll have all the local knowledge. Well, the only race I had ever done there, it wasn't a race. It was actually a rally cross. I rally crossed a mini in 1975 or something like that. And that was the only time I had ever competed at Knock Hill. So I didn't even know where the place was, far less have any knowledge of it. It, it, it was a bogey track, really. You always had a Knock Hill sticker on your helmet, didn't you? I did. And um, Derek Butcher and the whole team up there, I mean, I, I love them to death. They've, they've been... They've done a great job for Knock Hill over the years. They've they've um, ploughed money back into it. When I first started going there in '92, um, there was nothing. There was really I don't think there was any any pit buildings. I don't think there was a grandstand. Um, there really was very little in terms of infrastructure. I think there was a cafe, and that was about it. But they've done a fantastic job, and they've been great supporters of mine. I ran Knock Hill Racing Circuit on my visor on my helmet all of the time that I competed in British Touring Cars and it didn't matter where I tested or raced anywhere in the world I always ran the Knock Hill sticker on there so I was loyal to the place however it didn't reward me with any results no. Um, no. and that was why the the irony was not lost on me and I had to explain it to Ash Sutton on a Saturday when he got pole position I presented him with the John Quellen pole position trophy. And the irony was I never, ever got pole position there. I was never even close to getting pole position there. I think I, maybe, I, maybe I was second. I'd actually, actually, that's not 100% true. Because since I bought my old Vectra Super Tourer bike about seven years ago, I have raced there a few times, and I have been on pole position. But oh, well, I, can't, I can't claim a proper BTCC pole position now. It's a legitimate award, John, and you handed it over to Ash, and it was a lovely little ceremony and a, a brilliant new uh, annual award that Knock Hill have, uh, have introduced for the BTCC meeting alongside um, uh, one of your fellow Scots, uh, a much missed member of the, of the paddock for the fastest lap of the weekend, the David Leslie Award as well. I miss, I miss David Leslie, John. Yeah, D David and I were, um, were sort of fierce competitors because he... Um, he was a really good engineer and he worked with um, lots of teams. He worked with Ray Malik um, back in the sort of the Le Mans days with the the Spice and the Ecuri Cost Car and the Aston Martin and, and things like that. And he, um, when when Ecuri Cost paid Ray Malik to run a couple of Cavaliers for Verden Rowe and um, Harry Nuttall, uh, and alongside David Leslie, um, David was obviously engineering the cars. I'm paid to be a driver. I wasn't paid to be an engineer. So he was infinitely better at the, the engineering than I was. But what I could do was lap within a millisecond every single lap. And if someone made a change to a damper or um, some ride height or a little bit of aero, I, I could feel it, and I could then come in and say, yeah, that worked, or no, it didn't. David was much more technical. Um, but we were close in terms of fierce competitors, but mm -hmm. not close outside of the, the circuit, oddly enough, because I don't think he lived much in Scotland. I think he lived in Milton Keynes, latterly. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I remember having a conversation with me. We were at the, it was the Edinburgh Motor Show or something daft like that. And um, he and I had a bit of time to waste. And at the time, I think he was driving for Honda. And he said to me, can I ask you how much you're getting paid? I said, yeah, you can ask me, <laughs> but I ain't going to tell you. But I said, if you want to steer on what you should be asking, you tell me what you're getting, and I'll tell you just how <laughs> underpaid you are. And um, he told me, and he was being massively underpaid. And he... Yeah. He then subsequently went back, I think, and he said, Young, well, I'll never get that. I said, well, you will get that because you're highly regarded as a driver, as an engineer. You're a pretty fair peddler. So why would you not? And and that was, mm. I think, at that point, I, I don't actually know what happened because he never told me afterwards if he... Well, I, don't, I, I do know that he didn't get fired, so they probably gave him the money. 
that I suggested he should go and ask for. But um, in the days of, of the super touring era, the drivers were paid significant sums of money, some mm. you know, ridiculous sums of money, depending on mm. which manufacturer and who you believe and how much of that urban myth you believe. But there were some fairly serious salaries going on in those days. And um, the guys today, I think, I reckon there's probably only one or two of them being paid a proper salary, if mm. if that. I know one exactly. definitely is. Um, yes. yeah. and, uh, and, and actually, are they doing any worse a job than we were? No, probably not. But there was two dozen professional paid drivers in the era that I was in, and there was manufacturers there paying the money because... If they won a race on a Sunday, they sold cars on the Monday. That was really what it was all about then. And, and you own a car dealership, so you, you know how true that is. But it, I, I always find it, found it absolutely fascinating. You were loyal to the brand of Vauxhall. Um, <laughs> you, you sell Volvos. <laughs> and Volvo came into the British Touring Car Championship and it would have been, it would, have been would it not, the perfect match? Yeah, it would. Uh, and I'm quite proud to say that um, uh, the only manufacturer um, after the David Leslie story that I'm, uh, ironically, the only one that has never offered me a, a, a salary to drive their car was Honda every other manufacturer Ford, Audi uh, Alfa Romeo um, uh, Renault, BMW everyone offered me the chance, including Volvo and Tom Walkinshaw's right hand man, a guy called Andy Morrison uh, contacted me when they were about to start running the, the estate cars and asked if I would um, be interested in driving for Tom Walkinshaw. And I said, yeah, I would, I would love to drive for Tom. And just hit me with a deal, tell me what I'm, what I'm looking at. And they did, and it wasn't enough because I was getting paid more than that in a car that I knew would be pretty competitive in the coming season. I knew nothing about a wagon Volvo and, you know, maybe if I'd thought further on and what Tom Walkinshaw was capable of and had been capable of through all of his racing career, um, maybe I should have said yes. But the thing with Tom is, I think if you knocked him back once, that was it, you were never asked again. Mm. And um, yeah. I said no, uh, it was not enough money by a long way. And um, I never, ever got the chance again to drive for them. But you're right. It would have been good to have sold the cars through the week, then raced them at the weekend. Um, because I saw people come in the showroom when the television had, had played out the previous race. And they would come in and say, is that the car that, that's racing on TV? And, of course, the answer was yes, it was. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, it, and it made such a massive difference in those days to the the credibility of Volvo as a brand, because up until then it had been a car that uh, either your local antique dealer or your vet used to, to, to go about his daily business. Whereas all of a sudden it's racing against BMW and Audi and, you know, it's winning races. Yeah. It was great for the brand. And if you think about, take that to the, the really silly degree that Subaru um, was just a vehicle to take a bale of hay down the field for some sheep. Mm until ProDrive got it, stuck Colin McRae in it, and started winning world rallies. Yeah. And were it yeah. not for that, Subaru would still be just a utility vehicle for going down the fields in, whereas it's become an iconic vehicle. I suppose at the time, John, when all the success was going on with the touring cars and the super tours, that era in the 90s, were you aware of just how big it was at the time? Because we've seen how popular it's been with the super tours that we've had on the classic touring car bill. But during the actual time, did it just feel like, well, this is the norm, it's always going to be like this? Uh, no, I think w it grew up. If you remember, I, I was first in it in 89 when it was a class structure. Yeah. And it was, it was pretty successful then. There were some really big grids. Um, it wasn't getting real primetime TV. It was getting some coverage. And then, of course, it grew and it grew, and it just evolved into what it became in the latter stages of the 90s. Did I think it would sustain? No, I didn't, because the money that was being spent, the bubble had to burst at some stage, yeah. because the budgets that the manufacturers were putting in there, not just 
the cars, but the salaries, the best trucks, the best motorhomes, the best pit trolleys. It didn't matter what it was, you had to have the cat's whiskers in terms of equipment. Um, we knew that we were being paid to do something that we would have probably done for nothing anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I certainly was a used car dealer. Um, I had grown up through clubman's racing and production saloons and thunder yeah. saloons and things like that. And I never ever set about my motorsport career thinking that it would be a career. I never set off to become a paid professional driver. I did it because I enjoyed it. I got involved in it because it, it smelt and sounded like something really good. Um, it, it then grew and it grew and it grew. And when you, when during a, a BTCC round and just before the, the start of a race, you go and try and have a comfort break to get from the garage to the toilets and back to the garage again without being accosted by, you know, thousands of people for autographs was just impossible. And it was great for your ego. And it was only when you, you know, driving home, you, you started to appreciate the size, the sheer capacity of what was trying to get through the front doors of that place. And I remember at, at Knock Hill, I said to Gordon, you must be quite happy with the, with the crowds. He said, yeah, yeah, no, it's pretty okay. It's, and he told me what the numbers were. And he said, but the biggest we ever had was in the 90s with you guys when it was the Super yeah. Touring era. Yes. I mean, they were, yeah. they had park and ride. They were busing people into Knock Hill because yes. the site just physically couldn't take the number of people that were arriving. And and that was a good thing about it, that your average person and his wife and his kids were coming in their Vauxhalls and their Fords and their Renaults and their Hondas to watch yeah. their car fighting for a place on the grid. On track, yeah. On yeah. track. It was yeah. amazing. It made Cavaliers and Vectors uh, cool, didn't it? It, it really did. <laughs> well, it, it did, and despite what um, Jeremy Clarkson said about a Vectra, uh, we um, we didn't quite make them cool, but we made them slightly better than he made out they were. Yeah. Oh. I always thought they looked good, actually, <laughs> Vectras. I did. thought they was yeah, they were. It looked very nice. Yeah. <laughs> what, well, what did it feel like, John, when you say you know you get stopped by hundreds of people just going over to to spend a penny before a race? Um, what was it? What was it then like? going back into the dealership for the nine to five job on a on a Monday morning because um that's that's quite a stark comparison, isn't it? Yeah, I mean and I I sort of prided myself in the fact that I, I had no intentions of giving up my business and going to be a professional driver. That was never in my, my head. It was never what I wanted to do. And it wasn't because I was getting paid handsomely by the people at Vauxhall and I was also making money from my dealership. That wasn't what it was about. It wasn't the money. It was, I needed something to, if anything, bring me back down to ground level on a mm -hmm. Monday morning. I'd won a race at Thruxton. Mm -hmm. I'd get in the motorhome as it was, my family and kids. We'd drive home. They'd go to school. I'd get in the car and come to the dealership. And that was what it was about. And what it did for our business and, and, even now today in my business, we don't shout about the motorsport part of it, but the number of people that recognize me from what I did back in the day, and people are very, they're, they're pretty clued up nowadays when they come to buy cars. They, they, they check out the dealership, they check out the car, they check out, you know, is it what they want? Yeah, their neighbors told them it's a good car, and oh, by the way, these people are good to deal with. So they go online and they have a fiddle around, and, you know, then they find out that the guy that owns the place used to be a professional race driver. And and then maybe they've watched it years ago on telly. And when they come in the showroom, even today, I'll still get people saying, oh, do you still do any racing? Do you still watch it or whatever? So, I mean, it was massive. And I, I mean, as I say, it was really good for your ego. I mean, I, I was more recognised in England than I was in Scotland because Scotland's all about rallying um, or rugby. Um, but in England, I was every pub I went into or every petrol station I stopped had to put fuel in. I was <laughs> the guy off the telly driving the Vauxhall, and and the same in Australia when I went out there. I did thirteen years of Bathurst, and um, 
I would arrive at customs and, and the guy would say, oh, you're the guy that drove with Peter Brock. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. I remember you swearing on television. And I mean, it was just <laughs> something. It was great. It, it, was, it rubbed you really nicely. And at least today, many, 23 years after I retired, I have a super going business. It's still here. It's very well grounded. The drivers I was competing against back then, um, do they have a business? Well, probably not many of them. Um, a lot of them would play golf on a Monday or go to the gym or work at a racetrack, you know, as a driving instructor. Very few of them had a day job. I think Derek Warwick and Patrick Watts were probably the two guys. And Jeff Allen, to some degree, um, yes, had yeah. day jobs. But pretty much everybody else was a pro. And um, that's what they did every day of the week. Um, so the opportunities were there for me to to do it full time. The, the opportunity was there to go to Europe and, and race in DTM. The opportunity was there to go to Australia and, and live there and race in the, in the V8s uh, over there. But because I had a business, because I had a family and four kids, it wasn't really what I was trying to do. It, it, was, it was still fun. And guess what? I got a paycheck at the end of the month. So how can that be wrong? You know? Absolutely. John, John, you mentioned opportunity there. And of course, to get into BTCC, you obviously had to be a, a very capable driver. And your career, uh, it started autocross and hill climb. And you mentioned rallying as well. Uh, you took part in the Scottish Rally Championship in 1976. Just tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I did. I was a I was a Colt dealer, Mitsubishi Colt dealer in those I days. I started Mitsubishi Colt. And yeah. As, yeah, and as as um as a dealer in the Scottish borders, there was no racetrack, and um, everybody was doing rallying. So I bought a Colt Lancer, and um, we prepared it to rally, and I did ten rounds of the Scottish Rally Championship in this little thing, and it was a what they would have called probably a Group N today, but it was Group N less about 100 horses, I'm not sure. It certainly wouldn't pull you out of bed, this thing. <laughs> but it was, fast, it, it was fast enough to have an accident in. And I'm actually the only guy the Forestry Commission have ever written to and asked if I would stop rallying because I was knocking more trees <laughs> down than they were. I, I, I've, I started 10 events. I finished 10 events. But I'd been on my roof that often that we had to put a vinyl roof on the car to hide all the dents. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it was astonishing. It was the f it was a great year because it was when rallying Scottish Rally, for instance, went from the bottom of Scotland in Dumfrieshire all the way up through right the way up into the Cairn Gorms and Avi Moor, and all around Argyllshire and and then onto the east side, uh, and it went over three days. And, you, you, you know, there was one particular day you would start in the morning and you'd go right through the night till a breakfast halt the next morning. You'd have a couple of hours kip and you'd be back in the car again and off you go. So it was a three-day event over hundreds of miles and goodness knows how many stage miles. But it was a proper, proper event. Whereas now, a, 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 a mate, the Scottish Rally, I think, runs over a handful of stages, not very many, and it's finished by lunchtime. You know, it's just not the same sort of thing as it was then. But it was funny. I, I, had, a, I had a great a great season. It's funny you should say that because I was looking back at the first year that you competed in the BTCC um, and uh, became champion in the Class D Vauxhall Astra. Um, there were 13 rounds, John. Yeah. I mean, we have 30 rounds now. Three races per meeting, 10 meetings in the year. 13 yeah, and the thing is that we had 13 rounds, but we only had one race at each round. So when you were going to a track, you only got one race. Whereas today, they go to a track and they get three races. And and that's why today you've got drivers. I mean, I think I competed in 218 uh, British Touring Car rounds. Um, the guys today are, are hundreds and hundreds of rounds because yeah. they've done... Mm three rounds yes. yeah. a weekend yes. for the last decade. Um, the last few years, I think, of my tenure in there, 
I think we were doing two races. There was a sprint and a long race, I think, from memory. A feature race, yeah, pit stop yeah. race. Yeah. So th th there was still, that was probably only in the last four or five years of my, my championship, was that there was two rounds. So I'd have, I'd have loved doing three rounds on a weekend. That would have been great fun. Mm. But mm -hmm. that's why mm. today my, my name will disappear way down the order of merit in terms of races driven, because the kids of today are doing three races over, what is it, is it 30, how many rounds is it, 10, and they're doing 30 races or so, something, is that right? Uh, 10, 10 visits and three, mm. three races per visit, yeah. Um, yeah. But you're not going to disappear off, um, off the record books because um, to win the championship in your inaugural year is, is not a bad yeah. thing, particularly when, because it was a class structure, Andy Rouse was pretty much winning every race overall in a in an RS500, which was a pretty mega bit of kit. And there's the, yeah. there's the little Astra with the Scottish bloke in it winning the championship. Yeah, and I, I felt that year that I cheated because um, I hadn't cheated any more than anyone else because Bill McGovern in a Hillman Imp, um, Chris yes. Hodgetts in a Toyota, uh, yes. lots of people in lesser capacity cars had won the class quite convincingly. And there you've got Andy at the front, um, winning races and not winning the championship. But mm. you mentioned Andy. I, I, I think he's probably one of the all-time greats in touring cars, and I, and I don't care really who comes in the future um, and what we've had in the past. Andy, for me, is still one of the very best because he won the championship, I think, in four different classes with four, four different cars or something like that. He won it from the lower levels, then he won it at the, at the top end with the Sierras. But he he was clean, he was an engineer, he wasn't a dirty driver, uh, and if anything, he, he hated being tapped up the side or the back or whatever, but a really, really nice guy, top bloke, um, mm. I, I, and could drive the wheels off anything. But when I was getting beaten by him and winning my class and subsequently winning the championship, I just didn't feel that it was right that I should win the most prestigious championship in the UK and never have won a race. Just how does that work? Mm. Um, so that, it meant a lot to me to have the trophy and on the trophy was my hero Jim Clark's name because Jim won it in the 60s in a Lotus Cortina. And it took until 1995 when I won from a one class structure Yes. To when yeah. I won the championship then, to really feel as though I'd done the job properly, that I'd won the championship, I'd won it from I the front, yeah. I'd won races, led races, set fastest laps, and came away with the championship. Then I felt I'd achieved something. Yeah, no, I totally get that. makes sense. Yeah, so it's a 95 was the one then where it really, really came good for you and, and felt like the right one but let's uh, let's just move forward a couple of years as well and uh, let's go back to 1998 shall we uh, John you may remember a certain <laughs> wet Donington Park uh, yourself Nigel Mansell, Dan <laughs> Muller, Anthony Reid, David Leslie, Derek Warwick I mean what a lineup first of all uh, and you got the better of all of them what, what was that like? <laughs> um, it was brilliant it was I knew as long as my point south that Nigel was not going to win that race that day <laughs> there is absolutely no way that a world champion um, a, 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 a United States kart champion yeah. as well um, was going to come in there and win the British touring car race not when we had the very best touring car drivers on the planet in the same race that was never happening um, however he was good. He was brave beyond yeah. what I've seen. I mean, he, and, and, you know, when you, as a touring car driver, when, you, when you've been in the pits, and I can't imagine why a, a single-seater driver wouldn't do the same thing. You just wouldn't see it the same. If the car's been in the garage overnight, the mechanics have stripped it down, they put it all back together again. The one thing they've done is had the brakes off it. They've bled the brakes. They've done the different things. I always tap the pedal with my left foot to make sure that there's a pedal there my first time out in the morning. So just to make sure there's pressure just when I really need it. So 
that day at Donington, it was a wet warm-up, and first car out was Nigel, and I went out right behind him, and um, our car was okay. Um, it was never going to win the race, I don't think, in the dry, but I knew in the wet that it was pretty handy. So we go barreling down into Redgate, just straight out of the pit lane, and there's no lights come on the tail of this Mondale. <laughs> and then we, it, nothing as I went out of the pit lane. Then we get to Redgate, there was still no lights. And I thought, right, okay, fine. And as we went down the Craner Curse, he was not expecting me to come hurtling down the inside of him um, into the Craner Curves, into the old hairpin. And what I did was I got it just close enough that my passenger's mirror touched his driver's mirror and they both came undone. Nothing else, nothing else touched, just the two mirrors. And that was really a sort of, this is how it's going to be for the rest of the day, Nigel. Get used Welcome. to it. Welcome. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Welcome to touring car racing. <laughs> and after the qualify, the, the warm up, which was, I think I was quickest that day, um, I, I, it was about 15 minutes or something, and he came stomping into the garage. What the f was all that about? What were you doing there? <laughs> You're mad. Yeah, yeah. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Welcome to touring car racing. This is how it's going to be for the rest of the day. <laughs> And if it continues to rain for the rest of the day, it'll get worse than that. So get back in your cage. <laughs> but he was, I, I, I mean, it just, it was an amazing race because when yeah, you think, you know, there's people like Ivan Muller with probably the best car control of a, in a touring car of most yes. people. Menu yeah. races as one of the highest, you know, best in a touring car. James Thompson, yes. Rickard Rydell, just to name a few. Then you chuck our Nigel in there, yeah. and we're in there with a with a Vectra that, at the start of the day, you'd never have put money on it to win the race. But it, we plugged away, and we plugged away all day, and at one point, I'm coming up behind him, behind Nigel, and I radioed my engineer, a guy called Mark Way, and I said, Mark, is Nigel leading this race? Because I knew I was fairly well up, yeah. or I might want yeah. to lap him. He said, no, no. He says, that's for position. He is leading the race. I went, how the hell did that happen? Where did he come from? <laughs> and he, the, the Ford boys had obviously pulled the stroke, brought him in at the right time, stuck him on wets at the right time, um, and, and away he went. And I'm following him, and every lap, the track was getting drier. And in most race cars, you, you adjust the brake balance from front to rear, as you put the, the brake balance to the front um, in, in, um, in the wet conditions, and then you bit by bit by bit put it a bit more to the back and a bit more to the back, so that in a dry condition you probably run more to the rear than the front. Anyway, I, I'm watching Nigel, and it's getting a bit squirmish on the brakes down into the hairpin, into, into the chicane, the last corner. And I'm thinking, mm, he's not adjusting the brakes. I knew he wasn't adjusting the brake balance. And actually, the team should have been on the radio to him saying, Nigel, it's drying yes. out, adjust that. But yeah. do you phone up a world champion and say, just adjust the brake balance? <laughs> mm, probably not. You probably leave him to it. Or he'd probably just tell you to go to <laughs> yourself. Leave me, it'd be a Kimi Raikkonen, and leave me alone, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> but I'm watching him thinking, nah, he's not adjusting that. He, and sure enough, he just braked a little bit too late, too much on the front, locked up. And I nailed him on the way into the final uh, chicane, and that was the end of it. But I had David Leslie chasing me down in that race, and David, yeah. in a Nissan, was no slouch. But the funniest thing was that Anthony Reid jumped off. He was in the other Nissan, and he jumped off at McLean's trying to pass Nigel, stuck it in the gravel. Harvey is already in the gravel with a Peugeot, I think, Yes, and Will Hoy ended up in there, I think, with the other Mondeo, all in the gravel at McLean's. And I, every time I came round there chasing Nigel, I had enough time to look and see it. It's amazing. It's like when you're in a car, things slow down, and you've probably heard drivers say this. You know, Formula One drivers, particularly, where everything slows to a speed mm. that the general public wouldn't understand. Well, I mean, I could pick people out in the crowd when I was going round. I could pick out photographers at different parts of the track. 
Wow. Because you just have that uncanny ability to use more capacity than than you would imagine. So I'm looking at these three, Hoy, Harvey, and uh, Reedy, all standing on the banking, and they didn't have to say anything, but I could read their minds that was just saying, Cleland, whatever you do, don't let him win this race. <laughs> don't let <laughs> Nigel win this race. <laughs> So it was it was one of those things that it was um, whatever I'm doing I'm winning this race. Well, a couple of rounds after I take it, then John. <laughs> oh, we, we, actually, the only one that probably would have bought me the round would have been Will Hoy because uh, Harvey I think has got the first pound he ever owned, and 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 Reedy's even worse. <laughs> did Nigel so. talk to you after? Did, did he congratulate you? Yeah, he he did. He was involved, obviously, because he was the the key yeah. um, to getting the number of people through the gates there because of who he was. Um, <laughs> let's not kid ourselves. I mean, he was a massive um, draw to to the circuit. And Ford, uh, I, I've no idea what they paid him, but I would imagine it was a substantial sum of money to drive that car. And um, therefore, when Steve Ryder interviewed myself. David Leslie, who was second, Derek Warwick, who was third, and Nigel, who was fourth. He had the four of us at the end of it and interviewed all four of us. And Nigel was um, very complimentary. And um, any time, to be fair, any time I've ever met him since that day, he's always come up and shaken my hand and said, ah, how you doing, you know, this and that, whatever. So, you know, there was no grudge. Listen, he'd... He'd been there, done it, seen it, got loads of T-shirts. Yeah. And um, Formula One would just... Uh, touring cars compared to Formula One would just have been a breeze for him. Yes, you know? yeah, yeah. But it was quite an event. And it was, it was, I mean, everybody, even now, everybody, I was, somebody said to me at the weekend there, just weekend gone, that touring car race at Donington, that was the best touring car race ever. Yeah. And it's amazing yeah. the number of people that, that continue to say just exactly that, you know? Uh, there were, there, but there are so many things from your career that do live on, and many of them happened on live television. Uh, many of them <laughs> um, are associated with uh, the late and much missed Murray Walker. Um, do people still come up and say the say the phrase to you from 1992? <laughs> yeah, the one thing that I, I should should have done, and my my son Jamie continues to tell me that we should. We should um, produce T-shirts that say the man's an animal or <laughs> Clellan's going, Clellan's going for first or something like that. You know, yes. I, I think it's 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 one of those one of those events that I I didn't swear on TV then. Um, I just said the man's an animal. If I'd used a bad word, then that clip would never have been used as often no, as it has true. been used. Yeah, no, it's and true. I, it wasn't a deliberate thing on my part. It was just that. I was on adrenaline. I knew before the race what I had to do. I had to finish behind um, Tim and Will. Um, and the championship was mine. I didn't even have to beat them. But if there was somebody between Harvey and myself, then Harvey got it by one point. And unfortunately, with Steve in there, that took that point and therefore the championship away from me at that point. So, listen... It was one of those things, but you know that that you're talking that was 31 years ago, but the yeah, number wow. of people that still talk about it, yeah. 31 still years. Ago. Uh, but yeah. Steve and I, Steve and I talk, you know, quite frequently actually, and and we did for for a long time afterwards, and we actually, I mean, not everybody knows the the real backstop to it all was that when it happened, um, the Motorsport in the UK, Motorsport Association, wanted somebody for that. They wanted somebody's license for that event, for that accident. And they wanted Steve, because it was fairly evident that Steve was the, 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 the person that did the hitting that day. OK, I rubbed him a bit and I got up in two wheels, but at the end of the day, the next corner, he didn't lift off. End of story. That was it. Um, so we both had to employ barristers. And there was yeah. more footage than you could shake a stick at, and more <laughs> still pictures and more witnesses and everything that we'd got together. 
and we were going down to the MSA for a tribunal. And Will uh, Win Percy was the um, the driving standards advisor that day, who was going to sit in on this tribunal. And the night before we were to fly, or I was to fly down there. I phoned Steve and I said, Steve, this is pretty pointless. I said, we go down here, we rip lumps out of each other, um, you will lose your licence and therefore your livelihood and the chances of the drive in Germany. You could probably fiddle around about with a driving licence, but it doesn't get me my championship back. No. That f***ing no. Harvey has got away with us, complete with my championship, and I'm not going to get that back. So, I think what we should do is go in, holding hands, and say that it was a racing incident. And there was the deathly hush on the other end of the phone, while Steve, you could tell he was thinking about this, and he said, nah, he said, I don't trust you. I said, Steve, what, I, I've, I've just made, no, 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 he said, I don't trust you. I said, okay, we go in and I'll say it first then. But if I say it, you need to back me up, that yes, you concur, it was a racing incident. There was no malice, no malice attached. There was no um, premeditated plan to have me removed during the race. And I don't get my championship. You don't lose your license. And we come out clean, which is exactly what we did. And uh, when Percy, it was all he could do was to stop wetting himself laughing because he knew what we were up to. And the MSA stewards and officials that day had steam <laughs> coming out of their ears because they knew they'd just been rolled over. And there was not a thing they could do about it because we collectively agreed that it was a, a racing incident. It was a bit unfortunate that it was the last round of the championship and there was a championship at stake. And that's how we ended up. That's what we did. And as a consequence of that, between Steve and I, we formed the Touring Car Drivers Association, which was all the drivers had to put, I think we, we insisted on £2,000 each into this fund, and we would help to pay for the helicopter to be there for the medivac. Now, it, I believe it's there anyway. Um, yeah. But we, we helped to pay for that initially. And also on top of that, we agreed that we would have a driving, we would introduce driving standards that we would police ourselves to a degree um, before the stewards actually got involved in it. So if I've gone for a lunge, then I'll put my hands up and we'll deal with it and it won't happen again. Likewise, if Soper did it or Harvey did it or whoever else. So it was the start of tidying things up, but not everybody knew that Steve and I, we'd shared a car twice in the will hire 24 hours, mm. way back in the, in the early 80s. We knew each other. Um, I knew Steve's wife before he did. Um, it was it was just, you know, it just happened to be events. And I got on super yes. well with Steve, and I now get on super well with him because I think he appreciates we didn't go to war that day. We didn't try to have each other put in jail. And listen, the story lives on. And it's it it'll go down. It's, it's what made touring cars particularly relevant to the public because it was on the front pages of everything. It continues to get talked about. And hey-ho, it's... Um, if I'd had a pound for every time somebody called me, the man's an animal, <laughs> I wouldn't be having this conversation with you today. I'd be on an <laughs> island somewhere. Well, John, you, you talk about things living on and, and the Super Tour has continued to live on as well, thanks to the classic touring car racing club. And you've been out in your Vectra in it. Uh, have you enjoyed it? And of course, are we going to see you at Super Touring Power 2 at Browns Hatch next year? Well, the, yes, and answer your question. I, I mean, I, Jamie found it on Facebook and we ended up buying it back because he thought it would be a good idea because it was a championship. I had really no interest at that stage. So we buy it back, and what the guy that owned it didn't really know, he, he, he thought it was mine, but what he didn't know was there was a slight added bonus to it. It was my car, it was the first 888 built car, it was actually the car that went to Bathurst for Warwick, for Derek Warwick and Peter Brock to drive in Bathurst when I shared with James Kay in the other car. Um, so it was my car that Warwick 
and Brock used. Brocky threw it on its roof in qualifying, coming down Conrod um, into the chase, and it rolled over, and the guys in Australia beat it all back into shape again for the race. And if you look inside the car, if you were sitting in the back of it, holding onto a grab handle, for instance, all of the roof is all bent in where it rolled over. And, of course, the guy I bought it from, he had no idea. He just thought he was selling me my old car, number one chassis back. But actually, there was a lot more history to this car than even he realised that it had been driven not just by me, but by Peter Brock, who still remains today, you know, who I think is one of the best touring car drivers on the planet ever, sadly no longer with us. So I buy it back. Then Jamie finds a truck, which was the ex-Lotus test team truck. So we buy that. Then we bought all sorts of equipment and we've now got enough. The only thing we need to build a second car is a body shell. We've got everything else. Engines, gearboxes, suspension, you name it, we've got it. And we have a lovely little garage at home that, that it operates from. And when I first, the first event I was going to was, was Brands Hatch. And um, it was on the Grand Prix track. And up until that point, 1999 was the last time I'd ever driven, well, actually, sorry, 2002 or three or whatever it was in Australia, I'd driven on slicks. But this we're talking about was 2016, I think. I'm back in my Vectra at Brands Hatch, about to go around the Grand Prix track that I hadn't been around since 1999. I'd never been on slicks in a Vectra for about 15 or 16 years. And I'm about to head off to qualify. And I'm thinking, what the hell am I doing here? Why <laughs> am I doing this? But as I trundled out, got it warm, and the first few flying laps on that Grand Prix track, I remembered why I'd driven it. I remembered yes. why I got involved in the first case. There was just something about it. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up again. And there's seldom things that do that to me. One of them that sticks in my mind was I... When I went out to, to Monza um, to do the World Cup, if you remember, that was held at Monza for the first year. Second year was uh, um, Donington. And the third year of the Touring Car World Cup was at Paul Ricard. Well, I went to the one at Monza. And as I drove into the, par the park at Monza in Italy, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up because it just meant that much to me. And it was just exactly the same driving that car around Brands Hatch Grand Prix track for the first time in 16 years, I there was a big smile on my face and it was like, yeah, yeah I remember why I used to do this now. It was great. This is why I did it. Yeah, it was absolutely yeah. lovely. And you love that car, don't you? I mean, you, you, you absolutely yeah. love, love owning it. Yeah, I do. I mean, it's, it's got some history. It's a, a, it's a super complicated little car. It was um, when we... We've rebuilt it, Jamie's rebuilt it, and it's, it's a, it looks brand new in every way, shape and form, and we do take super care of it. Um, and Ian Harrison from Triple Eight said to us one day when he saw it, we were at the backup to the touring cars at Rockingham, and the car, we had the car there, we were about to go out and qualify, and Ian Harrison from Triple Eight came along and had a look, and he said, yeah, credit to you lads, this thing's looking fantastic. But he said, have you any idea how much we invoiced Vauxhall for each of those cars, your car and Warwick's car. And it was £387,000 each. Three, wow. Just shy of £400,000 each that they invoiced Vauxhall for the build and preparation of those cars wow. just to start the season. Then on top of that, you had the running costs and the tyres and the gearboxes and the engine rebuilds and everything. So you can then imagine what the entire championship cost to do with two cars it was huge yeah. i mean we were going out we would we kitted the uh, created the car up and sent it to kalami in south africa in 98 um for the 99 season muller and i went out there and we spent a week um pounding run about kalami we'd taken the track over it was the same when we would we'd go and do tire testing at um, Harama, Estero, um, Valarunga, um, places like that. We would go and do Mitchell and tyre testing. Or we would just go for a week and test all manner of things. 
So, I mean, it was big bucks in those days, and it was just, mm-hmm. we were living mm-hmm. in another world, really, because it was just surreal in some cases. You know, we would we'd fly out, you'd get in the car at half past eight, nine o'clock in the morning, you wouldn't get out till 12 o'clock for a sandwich, you'd be back in at half 12 and not get out till five o'clock at night. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just brilliant. And no wonder we were sharp. It was a bubble, John, that was inevitably going to going to burst. It wasn't going to last forever, was it? It, it was most certainly never going to last forever. It was. We kind of hoped that, that the it was going to have a slow puncture as opposed to having mm. a blowout. <laughs> yeah. um, but it, but in fact, at the end of nine or the end of two thousand, it had a blowout, and then yes. in subsequent years, it dropped off. The manufacturers lost interest. Gow lost interest, and it became a sort of shadow of its former self. But I have to say. You know, coming back, and I do watch and record every event. Um, I watch carefully um, with interest. Yeah, no, indeed, indeed. Uh, well, look, let's turn it back a little bit. So before we let you go, John, this has been absolutely fascinating, by the way. But here at the Barking Mad podcast, we are trying to build out the ultimate race circuit. So we're getting all of our guests to name their favourite corner from any circuit in the world. So is there a particular corner for you, John, that really stands out? We'll add it to our, our circuit, and at the end of the year, we're going to have this massive race circuit featuring all, the, all of the best corners from around the world. Which one stands out for you? Well, immediately, the Dipper at Bathurst. Yeah. Down the Dipper, because anyone that's been to Bathurst um, and has tried to walk up the Dipper... Yes. Yeah. Um, is it's impossible. It, it, it's just it drops off a cliff. It literally just drops off a cliff, and you you just yeah, it's something else. And you have to be so committed because you're actually aiming at the wall as you're turning into the corner, and and because of the nature of the the track dropping away, you miss the wall fortuitously. Yeah. But for me, the dipper. My second choice, if you can't fit that into your new track. I would no, say it can. has to be the... You can't. You can right? have two, though, John. Yes. Well, I was what, say what's my... your second choice? You can have two. Yeah. Because it's you. <laughs> my, my, second choice, my second choice is the chicane at Knock Hill. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Nice one. Do you want because the chicane it's, directly it's... after the dipper? <laughs> yeah, you could do. That would be... Yeah. I, I think the, the, the chicane at Knock Hill, because it's such a spectacle for spectators and anyone who's about to go to Knock Hill for the first time, I always recommend they go up and watch on the yes. outside and yeah. watch them coming up through there because it's spectacular, pretty spectacular. It? Yeah, It's amazing. Um, not only is that amazing, it's been amazing having you here on the Barking yeah, Mad podcast, yeah. John. I, I, I could listen to you talking all afternoon and all evening and uh, I, I dare say we might try and get you back on for a future episode. But uh, yeah, such we can a do pleasure. That. Such a pleasure. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. John Cleland. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you, John. Thank you. Oh, wow. What an episode uh, that has been today. Uh, well, Alan, that's sadly all we've got time for in this edition of Barking Mad. But before we go, there's still time to tell you about our partners, BP Fleet Solutions UK, who allow you to invest less on fuel and more on winning. Giving members and podcast listeners exclusive discounts on fuel, the BP Plus Fuel and Charge Card can be used at 3,400 locations, offering 6p per litre off both standard and ultimate grade fuels at 1,200 UK fuel stations. There are also significant savings to be made on electric charging too. And if you're a BARC member and want to find out more, simply head over to bp.com slash BARC. If you need any help, hit the callback button on the website and a member of the BP Fleet Solution UK team will be in contact. And talking of fuel as well, Alan, it seems like you're going to need quite a lot uh, because you're going to be quite busy over the next couple of weeks, aren't you? My fuel bill at the end of the year is ridiculous. Do you know, and, and, for, the, and, and for, the, for the first time um, a couple of weeks ago, and I've never, ever seen this before, a, a fuel station, it was a BP fuel station that I filled up at, diesel and unleaded was actually at the same price. So I'm, I'm, yeah. it's, it's, it's been coming steadily down and down and down, hasn't it? Last year, my fuel bill was <laughs> absolutely excessive, the amount of miles that I covered. So uh, 
signing up and, and getting this uh, reduction in fuel prices uh, is a jolly good thing in my book, that's for sure. Uh, where am I going? Yes, not too far this weekend. So a uh, two-hour two drive, two-and-a-half-hour drive up to Donington in the East Midlands. It, and this yeah. is a mark of how many miles we cover. Um, I see that as quite a local circuit. So, yeah. so <laughs> you know, two, 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 two and a half miles away, to two and a half hours away to Donington is really not a big thing. But it's the next round of the uh, Quick Fit British Touring Car Championship. And and yeah. the way that this um, the way this this championship year is flying away, since we've come back after the half year break. Um, we've had a meeting, two weeks, a meeting, two weeks, a meeting, two weeks. So after this weekend. We only have two rounds of the championship left. Blimey. It seems almost inexplicable, but yeah, it re- it really is. And um, and al- although there are uh, many people that just uh, think Ash Sutton is going to run away with this, nothing goes according to plan in this championship. So uh, so uh, Donington back to the Grand Prix circuit. I haven't been there since the nineteen nineties. Absolutely can't wait for oh, it. Wow. Oh, that's going to be an absolute cracker, isn't it? I'm, I'm going to be watching that on telly. Uh, I have Sunday off, so I'm going to sit and watch it on telly. So uh, hopefully Very I might nice see you, too. might see you walking around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Steve Ryder is always very keen to point out, he always manages to cram his face into the television and destroy <laughs> a professional broadcast one way or another. So, so yeah, <laughs> I dare say you'll see me. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to seeing it, Alan. <laughs> it will happen. It will happen. Now, don't forget that as well as Barking Mad being available to listen to on all good podcast platforms, every episode is also available to watch on the BARC's official YouTube channel. You can stay up to date with all the latest news and reports uh, from the BARC via the club website and its plethora of social media channels. And just before we do sign off as well, don't forget we are asking the question of the uh, which is the best circuit in the world at the top of the show. We we read out what's made the list so far. So uh, do comment below. Tell us which you think is the best circuit. It could be anywhere. It doesn't have to be UK based anywhere in the world. So uh, lots of events to come. And that means there'll be lots to talk about on the next episode, which will be back in a fortnight's time. Until then, goodbye. (laughs) 